what's happening over there with these women who they're meditating and they're making money and losing money and getting divorced and they're radiant. I got steam jobbed from my own incorporation. They said, we're going to give you the money if you hire this person to run the thing. And that all went south. I have $150,000 in debt. I had no income. I had no savings. And all I had left was my Blackberry, which legally I apparently wasn't even entitled to. Should I stay? Should I go? Should I quit? Should I do alternative healing? All of those different paths don't matter as much as your commitment to create conditions of healing for yourself. It has to start somewhere, right? I get to choose how I feel about whatever happens. I can control what I identify as. So am I identifying as the victim or as the solution? You had a company that you kind of co-founded and you end up getting fired from, from your own company that co-founded. But yeah. in any case, that led you to these fire starter groups, yeah. which I found, I thought was a really interesting initiative. Can you talk a little bit about what that was and, and how it came, yeah. came about? So I got, I got Steve jobbed from my own incorporation. So mm-hmm. raised a bunch of money and the dudes who the, the venture capitalists, as opposed to angel investors, which is an oxymoron. Um, (laughs) They said, we're going to give you the money if you hire this person to run the thing. And I was like, sure, totally. I'll hire that person. And that all went south. And so I got constructively dismissed. The company declared insolvency shortly after I left because it's just very karmic and not cool. And I left with, so the lawyer that I had hired to paper all of our shareholder certificate, you know, the deal, um, my own lawyer called me to say, you have to hand in your computer, your Blackberry, et cetera. And I thought, oh my, I have $150,000 in debt because I co-signed this loan. I had no income. I had no savings. I had personal debt on my credit cards. And all I had left was my BlackBerry, which legally I apparently wasn't even entitled to. So I thought, I know what I can do. I can help women specifically, entrepreneurs specifically help start their businesses online. And I called a friend and said, I'm going to do this. I think we're just going to call them fire starter sessions. And I hung out my shing- shingle. And then I had 60 people on my mailing list. And that was enough. That was enough light for one client. And you know what I had after one client? I had a testimonial. And then on it went until six month waiting list. And I was high priced and worth it. I mean, 90 minutes with me, you got your ideas. You got a map. Never called myself a coach. I'm not a coach. I was a strategist. I just, and that was based on. Well, I'd never, I mean, I'd never even gone to university, let alone take a coaching certification program. But um, I just wanted, when I was in the thick of things with work, I just wanted someone I respected to tell me what they would do if they were in my situation. Don't coach me through this. I, I want to take responsibility for coming up with my own choices. What would you do? And so that's the role I played with other people. If I were just starting this, and I looked and sounded and offered what you offered. This is what I do. You take the what, take what you want, leave the rest. So when you went to those sixteen cities on that sort of tour, where you were basically answering the call from anyone who was who was asking, who who was funding that? Were you paying for that, and or were they? Paying? Yeah. So what I would do is I would say, listen, you know, Jane in Idaho, if you can get me twenty people in your living room, I will pay for my own flight will charge like 150 bucks. You feed them. I'll pay for my own hotel room. So I was leaving those events with like $1,700 in my pocket after, you know, hauling my tail out there for three days. It was crazy. But at the end of it, I had a book called the fire starter sessions. And I knew a lot about business and I was really, I don't know. I have a tricky I'm not really into the word confidence. I think there's so much shadow to confidence, but I had 
that lived experience. I had acumen and I knew I could help you get from, you know, A to Z if you had a laptop and an idea. Mm -hmm. So with that, with that book, you, you talked about how the publisher basically kind of forced you to promote it in a certain way that didn't feel in alignment with who you were. And you, you learned some lessons about that, about not putting yourself in those positions to try to achieve the bestseller list. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, the relationship with the publisher was super cool. It's just, you know, we all wanted to win the New York Times game, which I've just come out of, you know, I'm just, Mm -hmm. you know, my latest book, How to Be Loving, we were gunning for it again. And you make a decision at the beginning of those campaigns. It's like, am I going to run this relay race or am I going to be a sprinter? And it's a very, very different way of moving and marketing. And um, it's exhausting. The New York Times way of going about things is, even if you hit, it's you're going to be exhausted when you get there. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's worth it, sometimes it isn't. Depends who you talk to. But that led you to the idea for the desire map. So talk about that connection. Um, well, that connection was, you know, desire map started on a rainy New Year's Eve night (laughs) and I had a baby and I wrote out all my goals and they were really like pedestrian goals. Like I want a new kitchen table. I want to get Hawaii. I want to pay off the debt. I wanted a book deal, not inspired. And I just started to write some inspiring things and they all ended up being feelings. And so that question on a post-it note, how do I want to feel? and a handful of other post-it notes of those feelings I desired at that time became the center of my career for almost a decade. I built a lot off of that post-it note. Yeah. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it, I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right, thank you so much for helping out, and back to the show. Um, I listened to a few of your interviews. Uh, uh, What a lot of interviewers commented about was that by the time you got around to writing uh, The White Hot Truth, that you were sounding much more authentic than, than I guess they had experienced you prior to that. And I'm just curious, A, was that your experience? Because I think it's sometimes hard to tell if I'm being, if I'm, if I'm faking it until I make it in whatever regard, right? As a, as a teacher, as a mentor to people um, and sort of blazing this path for other, for other women like me or, you know, other black people like me or whatever your, your thing is. Yeah. Do you feel it? And, And B, what do you attribute that to? I think um, what people sense is, I mean, I think everybody's being authentic every moment. This is just the best you can do. This is the most real I can be. This is my best version of fake, whatever it is. The evolution for me, I mean, I would hope that from book to book, I feel more accessible. I'm more... um, palpably loving. The evolution for me has been, you know, from desire map to white hot truth was that edge was off. I was becoming less brazen. I was becoming more loving, more aware of my own divine nature. And when you're, you know, my experience is, you know, more aware of the love that you are, then I became less mouthy. I swore less. I didn't have as much of a, like really just that hungry ghost need to be seen. (laughs) Um, And I'm still on that trajectory Mm -hmm. of, you know, just the revelation that I am beloved, that you are beloved. And then, you know, what's to fight about when you can touch that space you know, I can't hold that vibration 24 seven, but you know, I have those, the awareness is expanding into the belovedness. 
So I'm mm. way less pushy. Yeah. So you said that How to Be Loving was five years in the making since your last book. Why now? Why, why, did this, why this book now? Um, and I've heard other people ask you this question, but I think it's a good question to just get on the record. Who did you write it for? Who was the avatar? Who was the avatar reader that you would imagine reading this book? Well, I always try and impress my deepest, most sophisticated, raunchy friends. <laughs> and I feel like if, and they're all over busy internet ballers, you know, and if I can get her to read something, if I can just get her to read it and go, wow, I'm going to look at my relationship differently, or I'm going to change my tone, my inner tone, then whew, that is success for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mean, this is like an entrepreneurial short tangent, but I have two customer avatars. Um, one is on the path and haggard and really committed. She's done the workshops. She has listened to the podcast and she may or may not have had her meltdown yet, her breakdown, um, but she's in. And the other is really, really curious. The other, you know, customer of mine, reader of mine, listener is looking, saying, I, what, I want some of that. What's over, what's happening over there with these women who have, they're meditating and they're making money and losing money and getting divorced and they're radiant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my first impressions from the book, from, from reading it, were um, it's a book that could be read linearly, but also could be opened up pretty much anywhere in the book. And you'll, you'll come across a chapter about something that's not necessarily tied to what you read in the previous chapters, but it all kind of connects together like Legos. And I really like that about it. In fact, that's one of the ways that I've been formatting my books recently is Choose your own adventure, open your own page, open to any page, and you'll find something useful there. And your book is, in my impression, it's 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 a it's a kind of like a I don't know, it's a good way to understand what it means to be a spiritually mature person. It's kind of almost like a handbook for becoming spiritually mature. And the one thing that I was glad that I, that you included near the end of the book were the practices, because I think a lot of books, you know, they talk about the, the power of now, not to disparage, yeah, <laughs> I love Eckhart's, Eckhart's work, great, but, yeah. but they don't talk about the power of how as much. Mm -hmm. And you put a lot of emphasis on, on the how, because I think it's important to take it beyond the intellect and into actual embodiment, integration, and, um, and practice. And so I want to just talk about some of the concepts um, that you wrote about, because a lot of them are, they, they seem counterintuitive on the surface, but actually when you really think about it deeply, it's all, it's all pretty elegantly uh, articulated. Mm -hmm. So love, what does it mean? What is your understanding of this word that I don't think we have enough words for? We kind of try to jam everything into this one word <laughs> to mean so many different things. How are you thinking about love when you talk about how to be loving the ultimate inclusiveness and that starts with oneself and all mm. the fragmented selves so you love your shadow and you love your light and and i mean love i mean reverence so i'm very interested in in helping myself i've i've you know, I've been successful with this in some regards um, and helping others move from ground zero tolerance to reverence. And mm. it, that's the, for me, that's the work. So that tolerance being, I'm going to put up with it, but there's this agitation underneath the surface. And then we move into acceptance, which is an embracing, which is, you know, definitely moving up the spiral but like active love where you really finding the light and the density <laughs> and you know, you're in this space. Like, is it all of God? It has to be, it has to be all of God. And if that's the case, then 
the shadow is more than just useful. It's more than just useful. Like it's a, there's a, a gifting in all of the stuff that most of us spend most of our lives trying to push away, mm -hmm. but you have to look at it. You have to stop pushing it away to see the gift. And that is, I think that's how we become spiritually mature. Mm -hmm. That is how to be loving. Yeah. And you say spirituality is essentially the practice of thinking with love. Yeah. Can, can you can you just break that down for us? What yeah. does it mean to think with love? Uh, we have to want to. Um, it's aspirational for all of us, I think. Uh, I believe that thoughts do create your reality. That the mind is this numinous, powerful incredible tool to use for ill or for good. So you want to have a loving life, a compassionate life, a radiant life. You have to think loving, compassionate, radiant thoughts. And how are you going to do that? Well, there's lots of technologies to do that, but it really has to begin with the commitment, the commitment. I want to embody love. Whatever your language around that is, I want to know God. I want to know truth with a capital T. Like you've got to want to know. And I've this is one thing I've really I've become aware of um, in the last year or so. Like the mystics that I gravitate towards the most are all gentle of nature. There's a real sweetness to them. And they talk about this that single-minded such an interesting phrase right you know single-minded devotion you've got mm -hmm. to want to find out and then you use all the practices you use the meditation and the eating consciously etc to to bolster your devotion you talk about a lot of subjects letting go forgiveness healing etc i'm going to de deviate a little bit right now then we're going to go back to the content but in your process of putting this book together, because a large part of writing is just organizing your thoughts. And I don't know about you, but when I'm writing, I've written four books now. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how it's going to come together as I'm going through the process. In fact, I describe it as cutting the grass at Central Park with a push mower. And <laughs> no one can help you. <laughs> you have to get it all done yourself. But mm -hmm. being a student of, you know, spiritual books, channeled books, et cetera. Would you say this book was channeled? Would you say no. that you had some divine help in how you organized the book? And was there any sort of conscious awareness of, I'm going to put forgiveness after letting go, or I need to put healing first, or like, how did you sequence these subjects? I am not a channeler, <laughs> not a medium, and I have no interest in being a conduit for disembodied spirits or entities. So I just, there's that. And I don't need it to grow my brand. Um, <laughs> and there's a place for that. And there's a giftedness around that, that I honor and respect. And I'm very, very cautious with. And my job is to just keep aligning myself with certain frequencies. Like I want to align myself with love and I do all the practices to do that. And um, I feel that I have free will. I feel like we all have free will in this lifetime and every lifetime. And I also feel like ah, I am being used. I am a pawn, but I am, believe that I'm being used by something really lovely. Mm -hmm. And I'm on team, I'm on team love and team love. This is a thing, you know, pick your side, pick the side that includes everybody. So team love includes the dark and the light. Um, how do I decide what goes where? And even some of these principles, I've been working with an energy healer uh, for about seven years, the same person who I feel very dedicated to, who, if I were still Catholic, I would say this person is my spiritual director, my priest. And I will, my seva is committed to this relationship. 
So a lot of my learning is informed by this particular woman who lives a very monastic life. And we have this kind of quiet agreement around practices. Um, so this is not just me. This is every mystic I've ever resonated with. And then the me part is uh, divine love should be the first out of the list of seven virtues. And you know what? I think people don't want to hear so much about what's required for resilience. So we're going to put that at the end. <laughs> and then we're going to end on the high note of radiance because everybody wants the shine. It's, you know, so there's just some like marketing intelligence that I bake in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right. So can we talk about healing a little bit? Because yeah. you, you sort of equate life in and of itself as a healing process and that we come here with a certain spiritual um, agenda to work through some of our old patterns. And I love the example that you gave of, you know, being born into a family with an absent father and then, you know, your sister steals your boyfriend and then you get into a business partnership where the partner steals the limelight from you. And you say that that is all about you. It's all happening for you so that you can, you can heal that aspect of yourself and learn how to love, learn how to, how to, how to, um, how to love. So can you talk a little bit more about, about that healing aspect of life and why is it so hard for us to, to accept that when we hear something like that and we're going through one of those experiences? Oh, why is it so hard to accept that we are creating a lot of that? Or that it's happening for us instead of to us. Oh, yeah, because it's painful. <laughs> it's just hard. It just is. It's the challenge. Like, you know, it's um, it's running Ironman. How can you believe in those moments of like extreme endurance that um, this is actually a good thing for you? It just it boggles the mind. And I think that's the point. It's meant to boggle your mind so that you get to that state of beingness. You get to that, you know, that heart space that is mm -hmm. beyond the thought and it's beyond all the methodologies and all that. Yeah. But I guess what, what I also would like to know is how do you know, well, A, is healing, is there a such thing as a finite, you reach a finite point of healing and, or if not, how do you know you are going in the right direction of this yeah. whole healing yeah. process? Yeah. I think healing is um, about being more conscious, which is about being more loving, which is about correct identification. You get to know who you really are, not fake self, not ego self. You get to, you start identifying as an energy being as divinity, as love itself, you start identifying as being connected to each other, to something greater than yourself, you start leaving room for mystery, you start becoming aware that there's so much more going on underneath the surface of most people's actions and words. So it's, a, uh, you know, as Ram Das used the phrase so often, I am loving awareness. And I love the double entendre of that, of like, I'm loving awareness and I am loving awareness itself, right? I think that's the journey to healing. Why is it hard? Because we're perpetuating a lie. We're, we're indoctrinated into lie after lie. Every social system from organized crime to organized religion to the medical system to education to how even you know conventional relationships are set up is telling us that we are anything but divine that the power is outside of ourselves that you know we're dividing everything into worthy and unworthy it's the biggest lie of all to even ask that question that's why it's hard we're, we're conditioned so using that same scenario that you outline in your book, just to kind of workshop this a little bit further. Yeah. Um, what's a next step? Let's say, okay, I recognize now that I'm in this pattern of, you know, aban abandonment or, um, you know, or absentee, dealing with absent 
whatever in my life, what do I do next? Do I have a conversation with my partner who's still in limelight? Do I leave the boyfriend, uh, you know, or, or just cut off the sister who stole my boyfriend? Like, oh, I know there's not a one size fits yeah, yeah, all, yeah. but I'm just curious if we can workshop, workshop this in any direction that would seem, that would indicate what progress may look like on a real world day-to-day basis. Yeah. You take responsibility and you clean up the mess on your side of the street. Like I'm 50% of the dynamic, even Mm -hmm. if there's abuse involved, like I'm, I've chosen to be here. Yep. I did manifest it. This, this is not, this doesn't mean that you don't have deep, extensive compassion for how challenging things are or your, the challenges of your family of origin or your lot in life. Like, you know, the response to all of that is compassion, but you're showing up in a particular way. Your thoughts are vastly, you leave lots of room for mystery, vastly creating a reality. And all of your power, all of your power to get what you really want in life, what your heart wants is in that revelation. This is spiritual maturity. I am responsible for the tone of my life. I get to choose how I feel about whatever happens. I get to choose what I feel about whatever happens. I can't control the outcome. I can't control. There's so many things I can't control, but I can control what I feel and I can control what I identify as. So am I identifying as the victim or as the solution? Am I identifying as something, someone called me 20 years ago? Am I identifying with all the constraints of my religion? Or am I identifying as free, sovereign, connected, gifted, capable, beloved, energy, light itself? Big difference. So when you're in the predicament, the boyfriend's cheated and you realize, I had something to do with this. Are you going to be your scared self, your angry self, or are you going to identify as something that is much more vast and has so many tools to draw on to get through that situation? So, you know, we get asked in these predicaments, should I stay? Should I go? Should I quit? How should I vote? Should I get the chemotherapy? Should I do alternative healing? All of those, um, those different paths don't matter as much as your commitment to create conditions of healing for yourself. So like, what's healing for you? Let's go back to the definition of healing. Healing is expansion. Healing is seeing things clearly. Healing is you respond to life. You don't react. Healing is being conscious of why you say certain things. Okay, if you've got that going on, then maybe you stay in the relationship. Maybe you go. What's going to have you expand? Hmm. So really, it's, it's about awareness. It's about consciousness, bringing yourself into the present moment. And something you wrote in White House Truth that I think ties to this, as you said, that the first step in forgiving is admitting that you don't want to forgive someone, which I thought was just amazing. It's yeah. so true, though, because yeah. it has to start somewhere, right? Yeah, it's hard. I'm resisting. I really want to be right. I might even want that person to suffer. I don't want to do this. And then you soften. Why do you soften? Because all of that truth telling, all of that self intimacy, that's an act of love. And that act of love helps all of that chitter chatter relax. And then you get to the next level. You go, Oh, I'm resisting forgiving. Just admit it. That's love. That's love. Love admits it. And then you give it up to God, to Holy spirit, to your guardian angel, whatever you see is there for you and say, I need a little bit of help with this. And I think the help comes in. I think your soul will help you think more loving thoughts. Uh, which will get you to a state of forgiveness. 
Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.